Hello again and welcome to podcast 37 of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. Reminder, uh, during these tough times, uh, we have a special discount at the website, danjohnuniversity.com. Type in, in all caps, CORONA, C-O-R-O-N-A, and you'll get a, a very nicely priced package for the next three months, 29 bucks, which is great. In addition, we are getting so many emails right now with all kinds of questions. Remember, if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Um, we've covered a lot of topics already. I've been noticing a lot of repeat questions. So if you have questions about why I hate lunges or why I don't recommend heavy Turkish get-ups and, or why I don't recommend this or that or why I'm all in on certain other things, um, go to the archives here in YouTube and you might find the answers there. Thank you so much. We have a question from Dave. I am trying to help a neighbor of mine with no equipment do some strength training during the current situation without access to a gym. It's pretty common now, isn't it? I recommended making a heavy sandbag to carry, press, do sandbag shoulder to shoulder, squats, etc. I have thoroughly enjoyed and benefited from such training. However, my neighbor is intrigued but very hesitant. He is afraid of having to round his back to get the bag off the floor. How concerned should we be about round the back? <clears throat> you know, as you know, I'm a big fan of the work of John Jesse. And one of the things John Jesse reminded us of was the importance of round back training. Um, as always happens, we, we, we have no moderation in this world anymore. We swing. You're going to die if you round your back and deadlift. But in the real world, for me to get down, if I'm just going to pick up my socks and they're, uh, they're, they're underneath a, a couch, I got to round my back to get there. Uh, if I'm a wrestler or if I'm a strong man, I'm going to find myself in that round back position all the time. If you round your back, the important thing to make sure you remember to do is make sure, you, uh, some people call it a brace. My knock on the word brace is it tends to make people suck their stomach in too much. Well, really, a big part of bracing is what I call anaconda strength, which is when you the, you push, your, you internally push outward, uh, squeeze, when you squeeze the bag. In fact, once you pick up the bag from the ground, uh, I would always suggest that you wrap, squeeze. If you squeeze here, you'll squeeze with your body. But no, no, Dave. Uh, uh, can When people say round back lifting hurts your back, my thought generally is something else was there and the round back exacerbated. That, that's all. Um, no, I, I think round back is, 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 is a a part of a good lifetime training program. Now, if you're Olympic lifting, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> um, I've seen some people round back some big deadlifts too. But again, I generally don't recommend that because that tends to be one of those things that does give some issues for some people. Dave, that's a good question. Thank you. Okay, Lance has a good question. Do you have any advice for preparing to speak to a group about strength and conditioning? Yeah, I do. I'm a strength coach and I found myself a few years ago with a rugby program and built myself a good niche in our sport. So one of my former athletes has asked me to speak at a local coaches conference camp for rugby. This will be my first talk in a situation like that. Well, I, I, I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you the best stuff I know right here. And it's going to be the first two things. And then after that, I'm going to give you a way that I do it to organize it. For whatever reason, humans love threes. Humans love threes. So what I always do is I break my workshop and my talk into three parts. Now, when you read Beowulf, you'll notice that uh, the kings speak in past, present, future. This is what we did. This is what happened. Here we are together, you know, greeting Beowulf for lunch. In the future, we'll look back on this day and, and enjoy it. Uh, the Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln uh, Four score and seven years ago, we gather here today, uh, you know, in the future, you know, no one's going to remember this, but we all do. It works well. The past, present, future works well for toasts at a wedding. But when you're given a talk like this, try to break down the big 
the big points into three. Uh, and I, I'm not sure what your big points are going to be. Um, <laughs> you know, you'll notice that some of my programs will say, yeah, I want you to snatch, clean, pharma walk. And then I won't go on from there because I want people to remember those big three. Write those big three down. And if you're going to have time to go into depth, do your best to come up with three to five points on each one of them. Five points works really well uh, to support things. Three points, obviously, also. So three, three big points, three, three sub points, maybe five, and try to organize like that. If you write down those big, those big hitters first, okay, this is the big one, you'll probably notice that, okay, there's my talk. Here's the problem. Uh, Lance, is that you have to ensure that you get through all three points because I want your third point to be the most important. For me, it's always uh, loaded carries. Always, because most audiences know nothing about them. So when I get to that, people are like, oh, this, you know, you know, they've been sitting me going on hour after hour, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden it's like, oh. From there, uh, and you don't want to go too far with this, but a minute to a minute and a half of a story with each one of them. Um, humans love stories. Uh, as my mentor, Jack Schrader, who was just changed my life uh, uh, as a writer, he was uh, the former publisher of a major newspaper and then took a volunteer job as a proofreader. And he proofread my work and he would sit down and teach me. And he would always tell me, people love stories and stories about people. And... Uh, that's a G.K. Chesterton point, but, you know, he would always talk about catching the audience. And what caught the audience was a story. By the way, you'll notice I just gave you one right there. Um, so I don't, it doesn't always have to be rags to riches. It doesn't have to be, you know, little Billy was, you know, and all of a sudden we turn things around. But if you can find a story appropriate, like um, an athlete who did this in, you know, went, uh, I use like David Emery, the 400 intermediate hurdle champion at 68 Olympics. I use something I learned from him often in, in my workshops. Uh, I use me reading something by Kenny Avery, Seven Days of Sunday, and how that really opened my eyes to something. It, it can be 20 seconds. It can be, but don't go, don't have a long winded talk. If it goes over a minute or so, you're going to get in trouble. Three big points, three to five assistant points. Pop in stories appropriately, by the way. Stories can be those minor points. The stories can be those minor points. And then the thing I do that I think has worked the best for me for writing books and putting together workshops, I take those ideas and I get, I get out a PowerPoint. I start a new PowerPoint presentation. And what I do is I start to... Uh, so I'll put the three major points in. Okay, there's one slide. Well, then I take the first one, I put it the next one, and then I add the three minor ones. And then I'll realize that, oh, I have a picture of this person I'm talking about. I'll put, and all of a sudden I have another slide with this minor point with this person's picture. And then what I'll notice is I'll read something online, something Art Devaney said about uh, intermittent fasting, and I'll, I'll add that quote in there. I'll, or I'll say something like, six, you know, to succeed, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm talking about success suddenly in a weightlifting presentation. And then I'm reminded of Earl Nightingale's definition of success. I'll put that quote in there. And all of a sudden, that PowerPoint, and I don't know what it is about PowerPoints. Now, you're going to say, oh, my teacher taught me to do an outline. The, the reason I like PowerPoints better than outlines is my ability to add pictures and quotes to it. Now, someone's going to say you could do that with outlines too. But I like the fact that the PowerPoint is so easy for me to use. Three big things, stories, PowerPoint. Uh, I'd be honored, Lance, if you'd send me what you what your final product. I'd like to find out what you do. Thank you very much. Robert asks, in terms of aging and pure calisthenics-based athlete, what are the liabilities to not lifting weights as the athlete ages? Well, that's actually fairly simple. And it's 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 the big it's the first word in what I do for a living: progressive resistance exercise. You can make calisthenics harder and harder, but then you hit that barrier of your body weight. Now, I guess you could just get a lot heavier, you get real fat, and they would help you again, but I don't think that's what we want. Um, calisthenics has always had issues 
in two, maybe three areas. I think for pushing and pulling, it's they're, they're phenomenal. In fact, you can do pushes and pulls with calisthenics and body weight, probably your entire career. But when it comes to the squat, now, if you're just doing the movement of the squat, that's all you'll need for your sport. Yeah, body weight squats are pretty good. You can, you can get a lot done with just body weight squats. But when it comes to hinges and loaded carries, it doesn't work. And the problem is what, you know, when I do my workshops, there's this, there's this area in the workshop that I say that hinges and work, uh, and hinges and loaded carries are the keys to high level performance. Uh, hinges are snap, loaded carries are work capacity, and I combine those words to snapacity. Um, so as an athlete, as good as calisthenics are, and I'm not, please, I am not ripping on calisthenics at all, but when it comes to snapacity, it's wanting. So that's going to be the issue. Uh, can you throw medicine balls, um, rocks, and stuff like that, and, and, and you know, and get around this? Oh, sure. But again, everything's going to top out. But I don't know what your sport is. You said athlete here. I don't know what your sport is. There are some sports where that's just good enough. So it's going to depend on the sport. But just remember, you are going to be losing snapacity. We have an interesting question from Andrew. Andrew, uh, unfortunately, I am confined for a long time being to what I have at home and cannot squat, deadlift, bench press, or or overhead press. Now, that's true for a lot of people right now. I can do weighted dips and chins and decided to focus on those movements until the quarantine is over. I have a pair of 45-pound dumbbells and a 60-pound kettlebell as well. I would like to be able to train every day if possible, but I'm not sure how to go about intelligently programming this. I was thinking of using your Russian fighter pull-up program for both dips and chins and adding weight after each 12-day cycle. Uh, that's, that's a pretty good idea. Hopefully, it would not be too much to add daily swings into the mix also, but I'm not sure how to program them intelligently. Um, for those who don't know, uh, the fighter program is, is a traditional uh, Russian kettlebell certification program to where you... Uh, let's say you can only do uh, five pull-ups and you would start off day one with one, 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 one pull-ups. Day two, you go two, one, 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 one. Day three, if you can, you go three, two, one, one, one. And you just build it up basically to, if you can, five, 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 five. And the assumption at that point is, is that your, <laughs> obviously, your, your pull-up best is no longer five. And there's a hundred variations on it. Uh, I do think about every, oh, I, I on the pull-up, I would suggest resting. Um, if, if you're over, say, 30, you could probably go day one, day two, rest, day three, day four, rest, day five, day six, rest, because the pull-up can be such a pain on the elbows. We call it MAPS, middle-age pull-up syndrome. Um, well, there, there's your template right there. Uh, one, two, off. One, two, off. Uh, with both the dips and the and the chin-up pull-ups, uh, I think you have there. Uh, this will be a pretty good little program. You're, you've covered the upper body there. And if you go for a nice saunter on your days off, a nice little walk, a, a nice little traps, a, a little walk, take your dog, go to a park, whatever you need to do. And uh, that would be your rest day. And then uh, mix, in, mix in swings. What I've been suggesting to people during the quarantine, and, and actually I'm starting to think it's a very good idea, is do swings between each set. So if you're doing five sets of the pull or the chin up and you're doing five sets of the dip, that'll give you many opportunities to stick some uh, swings in there also. Uh, with that 60 pound bell, uh, I don't have much information, Andrew, about you, but if you can swing well, a 60, you know, you're probably going to be in that 15 range, uh, reps 15. Um, I would do a couple of days with just maybe 10 at first, just to get used to the chin up, swing for 10, chin up, swing for 10, chin up, swing for 10, just to kind of acclimate to it, slide up to 15 and see if those 15 reps impact the chins or dips. And then from there, if you can, 20 or 25, 
But you know, if you just do 15 like that, that's going to get you 150 swings, which is a which is plenty. I used to think that you could do 250 swings ad nauseum, uh, you know, basically forever. And then, in my experience, it just that works really well, and then it just drops off. You just I, I never want to swing again the rest of my life. You could do as high as 25, 250, 15 will get you 150, tens or even less would be a great number also yeah so this is a good idea um this is kind of your one-stop shop you know a dip chin swing that's pretty good but be sure and i and i mean this from the heart you you need some kind of walk i think um you know Stu mcgill the great canadian the spine specialist you know he's such a big believer in just going for a walk for spinal health and that's one thing i've noticed is that uh during my time during the quarantine is that I do spend a lot more time sitting than I normally do. And when I walk, it takes me a few minutes and it sounds weird, but to kind of grease my hips back up so that I'm kind of, you know, kind of walking like, like a Disney movie, you know, when they walk down the streets like this, going into downtown Disneyland, uh, that's maybe an image you didn't need to have. Great program. Love to find out how it goes. Thank you, Andrew. We have a question from cool. And I'm not even going to make the little joke I was going to say. Cool, welcome to the podcast. About a year and a half ago, I found the sport of arm wrestling. Yes, it's a thing. Yeah, I know it very well. Petaluma used to be the world championships every year when I was young. And strength is what counts, yeah. What do you recommend for athletes that need to cut fat while maintaining strength gains? Anytime I've gone on a diet, I concentrate on fat loss, building muscle, using the keto giant, uh, the, pardon me, the keto diet, but would lose some strength. Well, cool. I can only tell you what uh, the tradition in Olympic lifting. Now, you can disagree with this, but I want you to think about it. Uh, this is the system that Dave Turner had me do. One time uh, before a really big Olympic lifting meet, I was supposed to get down to 110 kilos, which is 242. Well, I weighed 273 into about Wednesday or Thursday of that week. And the plan was to do what you're not supposed to do and quick weight loss. Now, the thing about Olympic lifting is beyond warm-ups in the warm-up room, I only have six lifts. I don't know how many arm wrestling matches you have in a tournament, but I don't think there's a huge need for marathon-level endurance. So, and again, now, we're talking to somebody about being an athlete here, not about this isn't healthy, necessarily, I don't know how it's going to impact your longevity, but that's what we do as athletes. But I would suggest trying sometime a quick cut. Uh, I don't want to give you too many specifics. They're all over the place on the internet. They'll look it up. Uh, specifically, I'm not supposed to say anything about saunas. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically total fasting and uh, doing whatever it takes to, to lose water. But what I found is I weighed in, I think, whatever the... The, the, the fraction of a, a kilo underneath 110, I made it 109.99999. And then uh, the joke was I drank a glass of water and put on five pounds. But cool, we're talking about now, and, and other listeners, gentle listeners, this is a sports question. This is an athletics question, not a health question or anything like that. So this might, I would never tell a normal person to do this, but for an athlete, that's the advice I give. Be very careful of this. I'm, I'm certainly no doctor. I'm, I'm, uh, you are you know, you're, you are going to be dancing on the edge of some health issues with this. But you know, if you're young and uh, you're you're in basic good health overall, you can probably get away with a 24, 48 hour fast. Um, when I get the flu, I fast for five or six days sometimes. So that's that's my uh, that's my thoughts for you. I am amazed, though, uh, cool. As I finish up here, that the keto diet makes you lose strength. I, I find that fascinating because everyone I've talked to has said the exact opposite uh, impact. But thank you very much, uh, Jason. I'm 43 years old, retired from the military with a number of injuries that have piled up over the years, most notably a severe back injury. Since I left the military. I have been following various park bench style programs. Good for you. But my main pro problem is warming up prior to training. 
I spend approximately 10 minutes on the treadmill to get the blood flowing. You know, that could be an issue by itself. Uh, I'm just stopping right here, uh, Jace. But my, my point, Jason, is that maybe because of your experience in the military, that treadmill, that Soviet style, dun 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 industrial revolution model of warming up, maybe it's not for you. You should, right away, I think the treadmill is going to be a, an issue with you. To get the blood flowing, do some basic stretch and mobility work, and then get into my program which centers around squats, deadlifts, bench pressing, and loaded carries. I like you, Jason. Despite my warmups, my body takes a long time to get going, and I feel like I'm wasting my time in the first few sets because my body just doesn't feel like it's ready to go. I work out between 5 to 6 a.m. There's a clue. And my sessions generally take 45 to 60 minutes. And I'm wondering if you have any effective warm-up routines that get your body ramped up quickly. Well, a couple of things just pop out as we go through this. First, Jason, I don't break this to you. I'm going to say this as kindly as I can. You're 43. At 43, you can't just, you know, have little Billy knock on the door and, uh, hello, Mrs. Henderson, can Jason come out to play? And then you run out in the street and you start running uh, deep patterns or playing pickup basketball. At 43, <laughs> it does take a little longer to get the engine going. Number two, you work out at 5 a.m. Um, I remember the research back when I was a young, young athlete. I remember in this great article, I think Dave Davis wrote it, in fact, about that they had studied and the best time to train is at three in the afternoon. Now, it could just be because in the American system, that's when we train because that's when the school day ends. But then I thought about it through my career because I noticed the same things. But generally at 3 a.m., most of the athletes who show up with me anyway have had a breakfast, had a, had a lunch. Most have had a snack. And so they're fairly, they got their food taken care of. They're hours away from sleep and the issues with sleep, you know, when you wake up and you need to, all that. And uh, generally, it's a, a warmish time, time of day. Not the hottest, but still a fairly nice time of day. Let's look at those two things. I can't fix 43. I don't have any solutions for that yet. I don't have a solution for getting older. Um, the 5 o'clock thing, that's when you work out. So let's stay inside those two parameters. First, I want you to do this. Give yourself permission to take longer to warm up. Especially, I would say, well, I mean, when you look at the, the the four exercises you have here, loaded carries you probably don't have any issue with. But I'm guessing it's because you do loaded carries at the end. Here's one idea. Um, if you can do this, uh, change your order every workout. So workout one, deadlift, squat, press, loaded carry. Work with workout two. Squat press, loaded carry, deadlift, workout, you follow where I'm heading here, and do this maybe, give it two or three weeks, just try that first, and what I want you to think about as you do this, Jason, is the is it the last exercise that you're always the most lubed for, so I learned this from Dave Turner, so we had four exercises we had to do, snatch, clean and jerk, front squat, and then press, and then the next workout, you'd start off with clean and jerk, Front squat, press, snatch. That was always tough for me because snatching tired was tough for me. But I also found out later on it was good because yeah, I had to make sure my technique was on. So rotate that through. Uh, there's four exercises, so it's going to take you, if you lift three days a week, it might take you, give it like three weeks. See this, it'll cycle through uh, a couple times. I think that's right. Um, let's try that first. Very, very simple one. Number two, let's be a little bit more forgiving about your concerns. If you have to take more warm-up attempts, take more warm-up attempts. Don't be afraid, like on the deadlift, if you have to go 135, um, 135 225, 315, uh, 365, 405, 455, 495, five, if you have to take those minor ones in between. Later, in my mid-career, I discovered that those middle warm-ups were actually hurting my top end. So I started to do an interesting little thing where, you know, like if we're going to bench press, you know, maybe do like 135 for 10 just to get, you know, just to get everything moving. But if you jump to 225, instead of doing 10, do one or two or three. When you jump to 275, one or two or three. When you jump to 315, 
back with John Price anyway, when I used to be able to do 315 for 10, then I, I'd go back and do that 315 for 10. I gotta tell you that, that's an eye opener, man. That, uh, but if I'd have done 10 at 225 and 10 at 275, I wouldn't have had anything left in the tank for those higher weight, higher up sets. So try that also, okay? Um, the third thing, um, and this is old school as old school can be, do you wear a zipper up hoodie when you train? Uh, as you're doing your warm up, do the whole rocky thing where you stick the towel around your neck. Uh, maybe double up on c certain areas we can easily double up on, like, you know, wear a muscle shirt covered with a t shirt, covered with a thing, covered with a hoodie. Uh, obviously, wear shorts and sweats, uh, sweatpants, and just see if that helps. That to me is one of those things where it. it it seems to help some people. It, it doesn't do anything for me. I, I, I think because I live in Utah where we have such extremes and climate that all those little, a lot of the tricks I teach were good tricks for when I grew up in South San Francisco, but they're not good tricks anymore. But wearing extra gear really helps you warm up faster because you literally are warming up. Now, uh, if you need to wear a sauna suit or something like that, I don't know if they even sell them anymore. But I can remember... When I was young, going to uh, uh, I went to these two more, um, I don't even know what you call them nowadays, but more like community gyms. And uh, there would be guys who were, who were now my age. You know, they were always in their sauna suits getting their workout in. Um, uh, the idea was they thought that the sweat would lose body fat. But really what I think it was doing was keeping them warm. If you have, no, the last one, if you have specific joints that are struggling, knee wraps, elbow wraps, wrist wraps, those kind of things work well for some. We're at a new generation of those wraps, by the way. The new wraps, and it's interesting, you can go just to, uh, there's a Walgreens down the street here, down, down the street over here, where you can get these very good elbow, wrist, and knee wraps right there on the shelves of, of, of a pharmacy. And, uh, I tried the, the socks and they're quite good. So that's just an idea. So generally the, the biggest thing I would recommend you start off with would be the idea of rotating what, what lift you start with. And then the other three are, you know, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty standard things. Uh, I would suggest trying everything kind of like one at a time but by the way if it works keep it and if you notice it's, it has no impact then kind of dismiss that jason i do want you to get back to me and tell me which ones work okay thank you very much remember if you have questions email us at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and we'll do our best to answer each and every question thank you so much